Okay, so I welcome you all to this uh, seminar, uh, which is being uh, co-organized with U of A. Uh, thanks to the MSE folks there and to my uh, my co-organizers at U of A. Um, so uh, today we have uh, the honor of hosting uh, Professor Crozier, who is actually a professor of material science at, at ASU and is also a chair of the material science graduate program and a wonderful colleague of mine. Uh, he is a well-known expert in the field of advanced transmission electron microscopy. In fact, he has been working on a number of problems related to energy and environment with special emphasis on electroceramics and catalytic materials. And he has uh, published uh, uh, many articles in, in, in regards to the in-situ electron microscopy. Uh, in fact, he's a well-known leader in this field. And he is also a member of the American Ceramic Society. Uh, he's actually a fellow and a president of the Microscopy Society of America. And uh, he is also a member and affiliation, have affiliations with the MRS, the North American Catalysis Society. And he's also a fellow of, uh, of uh, many other such societies. So I welcome Peter. Uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. And I look forward to learning from you in the seminar. The floor is all yours. All right, Ankit, thank you very much for the very kind and introduction and I just want to thank the committee for the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about something that's kind of new for us. We've, um, it's something we've worked on for a while, but we're still very much learning about it. And so I've given, I've, I've used this word fluxionality, which is not commonly used in materials. And um, what you're looking at right now is we do a lot of electron microscopy in my group. You're looking at a cerium oxide nanoparticle and the black dots that you see are columns of Syria. And hopefully the movie's going to keep playing. <laughs> um, and you can see the atomic columns are jumping around. And, you know, electron microscopists have seen these kind of dynamic fluctuations for many years. Um, sorry, the movie seems to be doing something bad. Hopefully it's, you still get some idea. And, and we have often just ignored this and recently we've become more interested in it, partly because the technology of electron microscopy is so much better now that we can really see a lot of these kind of fluctuations in this, the structure of our materials. And also I'm interested a lot in catalysis and there's been some theoretical work come out just in the last year or two, suggesting that these fluxional behaviors, they're certainly stochastic random type of phenomena, but they're actually related to catalytic functionality. And so we've become very interested in trying to to look at them and characterize them and see how to link with functionality. So that's what I'm going to spend the next 50 or so minutes talking about today. Um, let me just, so just as a brief overview, um, we'll talk a little bit about, first of all, energy kinetics and this fluxionality, what this means. Um, I'll introduce you briefly to what we would call in situ or operando electron microscopy. Again, I won't go into the details of that in too much, but just an overview of it. And then I'll show you um, three examples that we've been looking at over the last couple of years um, related mainly to catalysis, uh, CO oxidation on ruthenium, um, identifying the creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies on the surface of oxide nanoparticles, and then a much more complex fluxional uh, behavior, CO oxidation on platinum and, and CEO2. And it's that last example where we really, uh, Joshua Vincent, the graduate student that's worked on this project for three years, has established a specific link between fluxional behavior and functionality in the form of catalysis. And then we have, a, I, have I'm, I have an NSF HDR grant uh, with lots of mathematicians and data scientists. And so we've really introduced that large team of collaborators to this uh, topic because, of course, we end up with huge data sets and we're interested in trying to understand how to link fluxional behavior, structure and kinetics together uh, with statistical mechanics. And so I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been thinking about doing there. Again, it's very much work in progress. Um, my group, I always tell students, we are motivated by energy, sustainable energy, but we don't make any devices. Um, and so, you know, if you think of the energy uh, sectors and the key things that are important to energy. Of course, we've got things like photovoltaics and, and, and batteries and, and wind power. And so we've, we're caught, we have different devices and processes involved in energy capture, 
energy storage and you know electrochemical conversion processes so that's something that you know it is ubiquitous across the energy sector whether you're using solar energy or wind power or thermal energy uh, and just a little bit about my group even though we don't make devices we we're particularly focused on trying to understand structure and function and at the moment we've got sort of three areas that we are looking at um, solar fuels and mainly water splitting uh, catalysts for water splitting electroceramics we're interested in ion conductors um, oxygen ion conductors and then of course thermochemical catalytic processes with nanoparticles and so that's kind of the the, the three sort of energy areas that we sort of um, occupy uh, in my group now if you think about all of these processes that we're interested in, um, uh, kinetics is always important. Uh, all of the processes involve charge, mass transfer or transport about you know, the device or on the surface of a catalyst or across a you know, lithium transport through, an, through a lithium ion battery, for example. So we can think in terms of uh, a general view of the materials properties and structures and functions that you know we're trying to typically transport mass and charge uh, across different types of boundaries so you, you you may have like grain boundaries we have solid solid uh, boundaries where you're trying to get on a fuel cell or a battery for example you're trying to transport ions across a particular boundary um, gas solid uh, tr mass and charge transport transfer uh, where you're creating adsorbates coming down onto a surface, forming reconstructions, uh, performing catalytic functionality where you're converting reactants into products. And, and of course, very important these days as well is solid liquid interfaces, you know, uh, charge double layers and trying to understand the structure of charge double layers and how that would affect uh, charge uh, uh, and, and, and mass trans transport. And of course, all of these processes uh, are kinetically uh, controlled by usually by some activation energy barrier which is shown over here um and can, can you see my pointer yes okay good because I, I i like to keep the pointer like this so i can play the movies and so of course as you all know we you know we typically would think about going from some initial state to some final state it might be downhill or it might be uphill but there's always a barrier uh, and where energy is lost, we have to get over this energy barrier. And of course, we would like, in, in order to make our energy technologies more efficient, one thing we would like to do is reduce that energy barrier. And of course, in catalysis, that would be the function of a catalyst to maybe go from the green curve, from the red curve to the green curve. And that would make, you know, my reactions to go faster. The thing about all of these charge and mass transfer or transport processes is that they all involve or many of them involve creating and breaking of chemical bonds so if, you, if you transfer an electron from one atom to the other you can think of that in terms of a change in the, the chemical bond if you transfer an ion from one place to the other it locally bonds and then it debonds and it jumps to another site and it's this idea of breaking and creating chemical bonds, uh, which I think this fluxionality sort of begins to appear. And here's just an example from catalysis. Um, there's a famous catalytic reaction, making ammonia on ruthenium, a metal ruthenium surface. And of course, you, you start with nitrogen and you start with hydrogen and the, you absorb them onto the ruthenium surface here. And what happens is the Nitrogen and hydrogen bonds are molecular bonds are broken. Um, you have uh, intermediates formed on the surface. Those intermediates may diffuse. They combine with each other, and you form here's a little you know ammonia molecule over here. And all of these intermediate steps are associated with these kinetic barriers. And of course, we usually think that there's a dominant kinetic barrier, a high one, which is the rate limiting step. But, uh, and that's a convenient kinetic model, but not always true. Sometimes you have multiple steps that have similar barriers. And so when we do something like an Arrhenius plot, we're kind of measuring sometimes an, an average barrier. But the point about this is when we show this in textbooks, say catalysis books, we always show the catalytic material breaking the bonds of the reactants so that you can make products. But actually the process that is required, the electron transfer that's required to break the bonds of the reactant 
also breaks or disrupts the bonds of the material. So the, the thing that's wrong with this cartoon here is it shows the catalyst surface as this uniform row of atoms, uh, the ruthenium in this case, as if they're completely stationary throughout the whole process. And that's actually not what happens. The um, Gabor Summers and I talked about the, the, the flexible fluxion surface of a catalyst where, where the catalyst itself is distorting and changing as the chemistry goes forward. And so that leads oh, hello, somebody saying something? Maybe remember remember to mute yourself if, if you're if you're not um, is the sound good Anne Kid? Yes, it is good. Oh, right, sorry. So um so this idea that the structure of the material is intimately involved in uh, bond forming and bond breaking is kind of one of the concepts behind fluxionality. So if I was to say what is fluxionality and we're kind of discovering what it is as we research it, you could just think of it as a sort of spatio-temporal fluctuation in some form of the material. It's associated with making and breaking of chemical bonds and it often has a stochastic or random characteristic to it because of course a lot of the time it's driven by by thermal fluctuations and over here on the right you're looking at a movie of a platinum nanoparticle atomic resolution movie of a platinum nanoparticle and i hope the movie is showing okay but again i think you'll see that it it's flickering around if you look at the surface of the platinum you, you have your eye has a hard time focusing on the atomic columns there on the surface <laughs> Oh, there's some noise again. You can see them easily in the center, but on the surface, there's the, the, the atoms seem to come and go. And that's because of this fluxional characteristic. Um, are there connections to function or is it just an interesting random phenomena? So certainly for surface processes, uh, you would expect if the surface structure is fluctuating that that will affect catalysis. It will certainly affect surface diffusion processes and it will affect surface phase transformation processes. And I'll show you some examples of that. For bulk processes, um, less has been done there, but you know, we had a big NSF workshop recently where we were talking about this. Probably ionic transport can be, uh, is associated with fluxional behavior, moving an ion through a lattice. Um, polar on hopping, where an electron is jumping from one site to the other, the low, you're going to get this phonon cloud around each one of those uh, electrons that are jumping, distorting the lattice. And even there are speculation that the de decoherence mechanisms that are associated with, you know, washing out the functionality of qubits for quantum systems may be uh, associated with with fluxional behavior too. Now, again, maybe the time frames are not ones that we can observe right now, but these are certain speculations about possible processes that might be connected to this uh, fluxional behavior. As I say, Summers, I talked about this 30 or 40 years ago. So why now? Part of it is, you know, as electron microscopists, uh, we have all these fabulous new detectors and things coming out now, high time resolutions. And so we're just beginning to see a lot of this and we're curious about it and we want to try and study it and understand it. And then for catalysis, uh, as I say, there's um, uh, Philippe, Philippe Sauté from UCLA and his colleagues have been doing a lot of theoretical computations about catalytic functionality and they're showing that actually the, the fluxional behavior of the nanoparticles is absolutely essential for the catalytic functionality that you cannot have one without the other. And so that again provides us with a further motivation to try and look into this fluxional type of behavior. Um, we're looking at it with an electron microscope. I think you're all, most of your material scientists, I'm sure you, you know that electron microscopes, this is my favorite cartoon of it. It's a very powerful microscope, uh, allows us to see atoms and materials. These are little catalytic nanoparticles um, showing diff very different structures. What is important here though, is we're not doing what I would call static electron microscopy. We're doing in situ or operando uh, electron microscopy in order to not just measure the structure of the material at the atomic level, but to measure the functionalities that are important in our case for energy conversions. And so the way that this cartoon illustrates what I mean by in situ operando. So we put a material into the microscope and we observe it and you see this image down here showing the structure of the material, or if you're doing spectroscopy, you know, the chemistry or the bonding or the composition of the material. 
And then to make, to do an in situ experiment, you apply a stimuli to the system. So that could be an electrical bias, it could be a light illumination, it could be heat, you could expose it to gas or liquid. And then of course the material is going to respond uh, to that stimuli in a certain way and you're going to observe that response and that's what we call an in situ experiment. To make that experiment operando, uh, you need to measure usually some technologically relevant functionality. So if you're looking at a battery, you would want to measure an IV curve. If you're looking at, say, a catalyst, you would have to measure the formation of reaction products. And so whenever you build those elements into your characterization tool, whether it be an electron microscope or a synchrotron or X-ray diffraction, then we would say it's operando. And it needs to be quantitative in order to, strictly speaking, be operando. Um, Here's just an example of one of the microscopes at Arizona State University. This is how we do our catalysis. So basically, we turn the electron microscope into a chemical reactor by putting gases into it and heating samples up. And, and then the other important thing, if you want to study fluxional behavior, is you need to have very high quality, very good detectors. So we have these new detectors. Again, I won't talk about the technology, direct electron detectors. Uh, and of course, the microscopes all have these aberration correctors. So we have very high spatial precision. We can pinpoint the position of an atomic column to within a few picometers now. And with these new detectors, our temporal resolution is approaching a thousandth of a second. And some new detectors in Berkeley are now 100,000 frames per second. So there's a lot of movement there. Just a little bit of advertising. We have just finished a six month installation of a K3 Gatan K3 direct electron detector on the Titan microscope. And so that's available. Go to the Iring Materials uh, website if you're interested in learning more about that. Okay, let me just show you an example then of using um, this operando electron microscopy to look at the structure, the change in the structure of a catalyst and to link that to functionality. Um, so again, I'm going to skip over, um, I'm going to show you slides, but I'm not going to go over a lot of the content in detail. But basically, if we want to do gas phase catalysis in the electron microscope, and we want to measure the conversion of a reactant gas into a product gas, we have to do gas analysis in the microscope. And so we have residual gas analyzers and we have electron energy loss spectrometers that, you, that we use to not just analyze the material changes, but to analyze the actual gas changes. And so this is um, an example of convert uh, using electron energy loss spectroscopy to develop, uh, to, to detect the formation, the conversion of carbon monoxide, which gives this peak at about 287 volts into carbon dioxide, which gives an energy loss pi star peak at about 290. And so by measuring the spectroscopic composition of the gas, we can track um, whether catalysis is happening and then Joshua Vincent, one of the students in the group, has spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out how to go from detecting the presence of a product gas to actually determining chemical reaction kinetics. And remember, when we talk about kinetics, you know, we think about a reaction rate. The reaction rate depends on the concentration of reactants present and a rate constant. And that rate constant can usually be written, you know, in some sort of Arrhenius form. Uh, and, and it involves an activation energy. And so when we talk about kinetics, we're talking about determining this rate constant. That's the thing that depends on the material. If you change the material, you change the rate constant. And again, I don't have time to go over how this is done. It's actually quite sophisticated and complex, but uh, suffice to say, we're able to derive rate constants and chemical kinetics inside the electron microscope. And if you're interested, you can go to this paper that we just published last year. So Ben Miller was looking at um, CO oxidation on ruthenium. It's a sort of model reaction. It's very important to the energy sector, but it's a great fundamental reaction to probe catalytic properties of materials. Again, if someone could mute their, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, and there are several hypotheses for what the active phase of this ruthenium is. So we're doing CO oxidation over ruthenium nanoparticles. But ben makes the, the, here's the catalyst down here. He loads these little ruthenium nanoparticles onto these silica spheres. So the scale bar is about 50 nanometers here. Here's a zoom up of one of the ruthenium nanoparticles showing the different surface facets. And then what we do is we flow oxygen and CO over this 
and we heat it up in the microscope and we start to convert the CO into CO2. And there are different hypotheses about what type of structure is active for this reaction, because of course, if you, ruthenium loves to react with oxygen. So if you put oxygen onto ruthenium, you're going to start to form ruthenium oxide. And a lot of the community thought that those ruthenium oxide surface layers were probably the key to the catalytic activity. And so um, we have ex situ reactors, so we can measure the the, the, externally, we can measure the kinetics of the reaction outside, and this is just an example of, you know, ramping up the reactor and ramping down the reactor. What's interesting about this is the activation energy is about 0.92 for this reaction, um, and the conversion, the activity of the catalyst is much higher when we ramp down than when we ramp up. If you look at these two measurements of activity are done at the same temperature, but it's much more active when you have had the catalyst at high temperature and you ramp down than when you ramp up from room temperature. And that turns out to be critical to determining what type of structure is active for the catalysis. Now, what Ben noticed is that when he started to do catalysis in the microscope, he started to see, it's hard for you to see here, but if you zoom up, you actually see the formation of a very thin, a couple of one or two monolayers of a, a different phase. And if you go and do detailed analysis and simulations, you can show that in fact, what's happening during catalysis is ruthenium oxide is forming. And so here's some model that Ben has built in a simulation. Again, I won't go through all the details, but during catalysis, ruthenium oxide is forming. And so that might suggest that the active form of the material is, uh, is these monolayers of ruthenium oxide that form because they form under reaction conditions. It turns out that that conclusion is wrong. So even though you see the formation of ruthenium oxide in situ, it turns out that the ruthenium oxide is what we call a spectator phase. It's a passive consequence of exposing the ruthenium to oxygen, but it actually has no functional value in the CO oxidation process. And again, the way that you can determine that is you can basically change the conditions in the microscope so that you can change the amount of ruthenium oxide that's present on the catalyst. And because we're able to determine the uh, chemical kinetics, we can do a very rigorous correlation between the amount of ruthenium oxide present and how fast the CO oxidation reaction goes. And again, I'm going to not get bogged down in all the details here. These are actually very complicated electron microscopy experiments to do. We measure lots of different things during the experiment, the temperature, the flow of gases into the microscope, the conversions. Again, I'm not going to show you all of this. If any of you are interested in this, it's published in the paper. But what we can do is because we know the kinetics, we can build kinetic models uh, remember, this is the rate constant of interest. And in this particular kinetic model, we're varying this pre-exponential term because the hypothesis is that the ruthenium oxide actually blocks the active sites. So the number of sites that are available for catalysis goes down. And so we can model that in our kinetics by, by just changing this uh, pre-exponential term here. And then what Ben did was he changed the conditions in the microscope so that he created the nanoparticles, the ruthenium nanoparticles with no oxide layer on them. And then he created conditions where he, he, he produced these short, these very thin monolayers of ruthenium oxide. And the important thing here is that he's got two kinetic models here. The gray curve here is a high activity model. And after he's had the catalyst at high temperature, if you analyze the, if you do a Fourier transform of this ruthenium metal high resolution image here, you see only the presence of ruthenium metal. You don't see any oxide present. And it turns out that the red curve is the actual uh, catalytic activity. The red curve overlaps very nicely with the gray curve. You can probably just see this here. So that the, the catalyst with no ruthenium oxide matches the high activity kinetic model 
Uh, and then if he changes the conditions, and you do this by heating the catalyst up from room temperature, now if you look carefully in the Fourier transform, even this exactly the same nanoparticle, but now you can see a splitting of the Bragg beams in the Fourier transform, and that's because we're now forming these monolayers of ruthenium oxide. And what you see if you look over here now, the red curve, which is their experimental measure of catalysis, matches with this black model, and the black model is a low activity model. So what that means is that by correlating the atomic structure of the catalyst uh, with the kinetics, we're able to connect, uh, we're able to conclude that that ruthenium oxide layer, which is in some ways a fluxional monolayer, it's coming and going depending on the conditions in the reactor, but that ruthenium oxide layer is in fact a spectator species and the, the most active form of the surface of the, the ruthenium is in fact the, the bare ruthenium surface. And so, that, and so that means that the correct hypothesis is that the active form is the, it's the bare ruthenium surface. It does have a monolayer of oxygen on it, but it doesn't convert to uh, crystallog crystallographic ruthenium oxide. And so Ben has just published this work uh, just at the beginning, just a few weeks ago in ACS Catalysis, if you're interested. So that's an example of um, showing how changing the conditions changes the structure. You know, we're going from different degrees of um, different coverages of ruthenium oxide, and that's changing the, the catalytic functionality. I want to move on to a more um, subtle from the point of view of the disruption of the atomic structure. You know, a monolayer of ruthenium oxide is actually quite a big disruption of the surface structure. Now I'm going to show functionality that's associated with much more subtle changes in the structure. And this was motivated by, you know, we work on fuel cell uh, materials and there's a huge debate in the community about oxygen reduction, not just in fuel cells, but, you know, the oxygen reduction reaction is important for so many things. And so we were interested in understanding or trying to understand oxygen exchange processes and of course it's or in, we initially approached this because of our interest in, in solid oxide fuel cells uh, where oxygen has to be exchanged at the cathode surface but you know if you think of separations membranes or different catalytic processes oxygen exchanges is is important for so many different processes and so I had been to an ionics meeting and uh, and there was a 50% of the papers were all about this oxygen exchange process and there were all these complicated kinetic models and no one really knew where it happened or what the active sites were. So um, if you think about oxygen exchange, so this is a process that occurs spontaneously at the surface of a reducible oxide. Uh, basically, the chemical potential of oxygen in the gas phase and the chemical potential of oxygen in the solid have to be in equilibrium. And what that actually means in practice, because you have thermal fluctuations, is that the gas and the solid are exchanging oxygen all the time. So if you imagine an oxygen molecule coming down onto the surface of an oxide, it's most likely to chemisorb in the vicinity of where there are oxygen vacancies. So we probably need two oxygen vacancies fairly close together. Um, the molecule comes down and it sticks. In order to incorporate those oxygens into the lattice, each oxygen atom has to pick up two electrons. So it dissociates and there's an electron transfer process. And then those uh, cations incorporate into these oxygen vacancies and essentially the oxygen vacancies are annihilated. And if you're thinking about trying to make an observation of this, um, what happens is, at the moment with the electron microscopy, we can't really see this initial adsorption process. We probably will be able to see it soon, but we can't see it right now. Um, we'll not be able to see the charge transfer in any uh, easy way soon, but we should be able to see the creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies at the surface. That's something that should be possible with the kind of picometer spatial resol precision that we have at the moment. So we decided to investigate whether or not this was possible. And before we did any experiments, uh, we, uh, Tara Boland ran some molecular dynamics simulations. So here's the surface of a uh, cerium oxide, the, the red atoms are the oxygens. And what she's done is she's just plucked an oxygen out of the surface here. And then uh, we run the, uh, the molecular static simulations. And, and of course the surface relaxes because the 
you know, you pull that this O2 minus and the electrons transfer to the neighboring series. And then we took these molecular dynamics movies and we simulated the electron images. We, you know, simulated images of what would it look like. And so here's what the high resolution image would look like. The bright blobs you see here are the seria cations. These little fainter blobs you see are the um, oxygen uh, anions. And, but the thing that's so obvious is even though we're pulling out oxygen and we're interested in seeing oxygen, the thing that you really notice here is that the most obvious change in the micrograph is the motion of the cation. So each time you create or annihilate an oxygen vacancy, the cation moves and it's moving by about 20 to 30 picometers, which is definitely something that we should be able to see in contemporary aberration corrected microscopes. So. Ethan Lawrence uh, uh, went onto the microscope. We realized that we can't do these experiments at 500 degrees because the kinetics is too fast. So we slow down the kinetics. Actually, it turns out if you, if you work at room temperature, you can match the kinetics to the, the speed of our current detectors. Uh, so he, he worked at room temperature. And here's an image now, an experimental image of the surface of a cerium oxide nanoparticle. Again, the bright blobs are the cerium. The fainter blobs are the oxygen, and here's an atomic step and another step. And what was very interesting is that this is a one second exposure. The cation, the images of the cations at the steps look fuzzy, they look blurred. And we realized that if the cations are moving rapidly back and forward at a time that's much faster than the exposure time, then they're going to look blurred. It's like using your cell phone camera to take a picture of motion if your exposure time is too long, then you'll get an image that's streaked and out of focus, and that's what we have here. So if we go to faster time resolution, we should be able to confirm whether or not that fuzziness that we see, that, that blurring, is actually associated with dynamic motion. And so here's now running at 40 frames per second, exactly the same step edge. And now you can see, even though of course the image is very noisy, but I think uh, you can see that that cation at the edge of the step is actually as sharp as the other cations, but it's moving around a lot more. And that's why it appears fuzzy here. So that's exactly the fingerprint that we would expect to have for creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies. And so, we can quantify these images. Again, I won't go through all the details, but basically we can measure the mean cation displacement of the different cations on the surface here. And the color scale is that the mean cation displacement, dark blue is about a five picometer mean displacement and red is a 25 picometer mean displacement. So our error in the measurement here is about five picometers. So you can see the subsurface uh, layers are, are basically stationary as far as we can determine within our error, but the step edges show very high uh, mean column displacements. And not just the step edges, but the terraces that you see here are not all the same. This terrace is perfectly flat and it's pretty stable and not reactive, no oxygen exchange going on there. Whereas this terrace is showing 5% strain and you can see that there's a lot of creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies along that terrace. So not all terraces are the same. Some of them are strained and they show different activities. Um, and this is a one, one, one surface. Uh, we can also go to other surfaces and look at the fluxional behavior of the cations on those surfaces. And again, this is now a one, one, oh surface and you see very active cations suggesting lots of creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies here. And in fact, the observation that the 111 surface, the 110 surface is much more active than the 111 surface is in agreement with density functional calculations for vacancy formation energies, which shows that it's um, the vacancy formation energy on the 111 surface is higher than the 110 surface. So we're qualitatively agreeing with the, the density functional theory calculations. So now that we have this approach, we can actually go in and count uh, the number of uh, oxygen vacancy creation events that are taking place. So we're actually counting the displacements that are occurring now. And again, we're running at room temperature. So the number of vacancies created at, a more, at one of the active sites would be on the order of like 15 to 20 vacancies per second. So we can count the number of vacancy creation and annihilation events at different sites on the surface. 
And then, you know, usually if you think about um, that, it's convenient to convert that to an activation energy because we, we, we know the probability now of vacancies being formed. And so we can now go around and we can convert those observations into activation energies. And again, just showing some of the, the way this is done here by inverting the Arrhenius equation. Again, I won't go through all the details. It's published in, it's just been published in this ACS Nano paper, but you see activation energies varying from about 0.8 down to about 0.7. And in fact, it's lower in some places. And you might think that's not very much, but remember even a tenth of an EV change in, in the activation energy can translate into orders of magnitude change in an oxygen exchange reaction rate. So, how am I doing for time? Okay. You've got thirty minutes, more than thirty minutes. Okay, all right. I think I'm. I think I'm. I think I've, I'm trying to keep myself on time. I think I should be fine. Yeah, I'll probably finish a wee bit early. So that's an example now of what we're seeing is we're measuring the oxygen. Maybe if I just go back to the movie, it's kind of, we're measuring the location of oxygen creation and annihilation on the surface, not by watching the oxygen, but by watching the cation. And actually I was explaining this to uh, somebody recently and they said, this is like trying to detect the wind by watching the leaves uh, rustle in the trees. So we're not actually seeing the wind, we're not seeing the oxygen, we're seeing the effect of the oxygen being removed from the lattice and how that's causing this fluxional distortion, this, uh, this localized strain, if you will, uh, in the nearby cation sublattice. And, and the spatial resolution, the, the, the precision for these measurements is about five picometers. Um, if you get good enough signal to noise, the precision right now is, uh, you can get precisions of below one picometer right now. And so in principle, you could imagine perhaps using this kind of technique to track ion transport through the bulk, although no one has done that right now, but it's something we would be interested in trying. And I know that some of you are interested in, in batteries. I mean, in principle, you could apply the same technique to look at lithium transport. Uh, it would be hard, but in, you know, it might be worth trying to do. So I, so we, I want to go on to another, um, so we're becoming more confident now. So we, we can sort of quantify catalysis going on in these materials and we can see these fluxional behaviors going on. And so now we want to, Joshua Vincent came along and, and he's going to try and do something that's uh, a much more complex fluxional behavior. Uh, this is again, uh, oxidation of CO, but now over platinum nanoparticles supported on ceria. So we're going to take our cerium oxide, which we know can exchange oxygen, and we're going to put catalytically active platinum nanoparticles on it. And that's going to now provide not just fluxional behavior at the surface, but we're now going to have a metal ceramic interface. So we're going to have the possibility of fluxional behavior uh, due to interfacial interactions. So the cartoon of what's going on here is we've got I can find my pointer. So we've got platinum nanoparticle on Syria. We're going to um, expose it to carbon monoxide and platinum now loves to bond to carbon monoxide. It likes to form a carbide. So you see the, the CO goes down onto the platinum carbon side down. So you have this platinum carbon you know, carbide bond. So the, the platinum nanoparticle is typically completely covered with CO. And in order to convert the CO to CO2, the carbon monoxide has to migrate across the surface of the nanoparticle down to the interface with the ceria. And what it does is it then rips the oxygen out of the ceria and creates an oxygen vacancy. And then molecular oxygen comes back and backfills that vacancy to restore the cycle. So this process where the oxygen to oxidize the CO is coming from the, the, the crystal lattice that's called a Mars Van Krebelen mechanism. That's a well-known oxidation mechanism in catalysis. So we were interested in trying to investigate the possible fluxional behaviors that are associated with this interfacial um, catalytic mechanism. So, Here's just some preliminary data that Josh did. This is um, 
the platinum nanoparticle on Syria, he made, I won't tell you how he makes the materials, but this is a platinum nanoparticle on Syria at room temperature in a nitrogen atmosphere. And this is, you know, typically what you'll see in electron microscope journals. You see this beautiful atomic structure and it looks very nice. And the facets are exactly what you would expect to be, you know, one, one, one facets. It's kind of the wolf shape or the winter bottom shape for those of you know, that know about such things. What's interesting is if you switch the nitrogen atmosphere for carbon monoxide and oxygen, this is exactly the same nanoparticle. Um, it's at room temperature. All he's done is change the nitrogen gas for carbon monoxide and oxygen. And you can see the cerea, right? The cerea is still quite visible here, but you're probably having a hard time seeing the platinum. You might think the platinum particle has gone. Actually, it's not gone. It's still there. It's undergoing furious fluxional behavior. It's, it's uh, to the extent that the fluxional behavior is much faster than our exposure time. So we're, we're not even able to capture the atomic structure. Um, it's changing so rapidly. And so that was very interesting and surprising that it was so dramatic. And of course, as an electron microscopist, when we see instabilities in our particles, in the olden days, we would never ever have taken a picture of that. That would not never be the one that would go in the journal. The one that would go in the journal would be this one over here. And I'm going to make the argument now that this beautiful image over here of the stable structure is functionally irrelevant. The structure that's relevant is this one that we're having a hard time seeing. It's the one that the electron microscopists don't like because we can't get this beautiful image. If I just frame average that, there was, here's the, the beautiful, uh, structure that you see with this is now one second exposure in nitrogen. Beautiful. I'm happy to publish that in my in my in my journal article, my ACS Nano. Here's the same nanoparticle with the one second exposure, and it looks terrible, right? And I'm not going to publish that. I guess you know the reviewers will tell me it's not focused correctly or something like that. But in fact, it is focused correctly, it's just undergoing dynamic fluctuations. And there are other things that I won't go into, but um, crystallographic shear planes and things like that in the Syria that are also happening at room temperature that some of you with good eyes might be able to notice. And this is not just happening in our CO oxidation. We're starting to see this. Josh has also been working in collaboration with uh, Anatoly Frenkel at Sunny and Brookhaven on the water gas shift reaction. It's another very important reaction for the energy sector. And here again, it's also performed in platinum on, on Syria. And this is the platinum nanoparticle in the presence of CO. Uh, and this is the platinum nanoparticle in the presence of CO and water. And it's exactly the same nanoparticle. Um, it's not particularly stable in any environment, but it's a bit more stable when water's present. The water seems to be stabilizing it. But if, again, if you look at the surface, the surface is very dynamic. Whereas in the CO, you can maybe just make out that the center of the particle is quite stable, but the surface is undergoing very significant structural uh, reconfigurations. And this is, I'm not going to talk about the details of this example today, but it's, it's, it's um, just been accepted. It's in press and nature communications and they should be out fairly soon. So going back to CO oxidation, I'm going to just step you through, Josh is working on this paper now, so we wanted to present this <laughs> to try and get our ideas clear. Um, I'm going to, we're going to focus on several fluxional behaviors that are associated with the functioning of this catalyst. So here's just, a, the, again, the data is very noisy. So the quality of the images is not going to look good because of the fluxional behavior, right? So, um, so here's two platinum nanoparticles uh, separated by about, you know, 20 nanometers. Uh, they're both anchored on the step edge of the cerea. And this is 144 degrees and there's no catalysis going on. So the amount of CO that's converted to CO2 is zero. And the platinum nanoparticles kind of look messy. And here, this is a frame average. Here are individual frames from the same uh, sequence. And again, you can see that with the signal to noise, the platinum nanoparticles, they look pretty awful. But if you take the Fourier transform of these platinum nanoparticles, so here's the Fourier transforms, these look like diffraction patterns, okay? You can see that in these four frames that I'm showing you, the structure of the different, the, the Bragg spots you see in the diffractogram are very different. 
because the particle is undergoing structural fluctuations. So the, it's not amorphous, it's not becoming, it's, it's, it's changing from one metastable state to the other and it's doing it rapidly. We know from synchrotron studies that it still is basically FCC, it has an FCC structure, but it's rapidly reconfiguring all the time. And that's what we mean by flux modes, not amorphous. It looks amorphous in the image for those of you that are electron microscopists, but it's not amorphous. So what happens when you heat this up uh, in the microscope and start to get catalysis going on? So this is three frames from the same region of the catalyst. And this X number here is telling us about how much of the carbon monoxide gets converted to carbon dioxide. So we've zero. 15% here and 20% there. And for those of you that know about catalysis, you often express the kinetics in terms of a turnover frequency. So the turnover frequency over here is about one. The turnover frequency here is zero. And there are several things that Josh noticed here as he increased the turnover frequency. First of all, as we might have expected, the platinum nanoparticle, the atomic structure that we can see in the platinum nanoparticle is almost completely obliterated. It's very hard to see any atomic structure now because these platinum nanoparticles are fluctuating so much. But the other thing, remember I talked to you about the seria oxygen vacancy in creation and how that when you're having oxygen vacancies created and annihilated on the surface of seria, the cation sublattice moves. So if you look over here, you can see the surface of the cilia looks very fuzzy. And again, it's not that Josh has taken the images out of focus because if you look at the subsurface cilia, they're very sharp. The surface of the cilia is very fuzzy. And in fact, the cilia atoms near the perimeter, near the interfacial sites with the platinum are also fuzzy too. And we know from our prior work now that that fuzziness is associated with oxygen vacancy creation and annihilation. And we know that oxygen vacancy creation and annihilation is a critical part of this Mars Van Crevelin oxidation process. So what we think we're seeing now is an atomic level view of the structural fluctuations associated with the Mars Van Crevelin process that happens at the interface here. Now, Josh has spent a lot of time we're trying to figure out how to quantify this and correlate it directly with catalytic functionality. And I'll just show you some of the things that he's done. Uh, first of all, looking at the platinum nanoparticle, we know it's undergoing these fluxional behaviors. And by taking the Fourier transform of this, he's able to measure, it's essentially the visibility of the diffraction spots. As the fluxional behavior becomes more pronounced, the visibility of the diffraction spots becomes weaker. And so what he's doing now is he's plotting the, the visibility of the diffraction spots as a function of the turnover frequency. And you can see that as the turnover frequency increases, the visibility of the diffraction spot decreases. And there's actually quite a nice linear relationship between, we would say, the fluxional behavior of the platinum and the catalytic functionality. So that's really important. We've now established not just that the nanoparticle is dancing around, we've established a correlation with function, which is what you know, people have speculated and hypothesized. And the reason now we can start to understand why it's dancing around, the way the platinum, if you look at the, if you look at the interface between platinum metal and cereal, um, it's usually, there's usually a, a well-defined topotactic relationship. The 111 planes in both structures usually are, are parallel. And there's, and the platinum is attached to the cilia via bridging oxygens. So you have this platinum oxygen cilia bond that anchors the platinum onto the cilia as shown in this cartoon here. When you start to pluck out the oxygen from the interfacial site in order to oxidize the CO, what happens is you create an oxygen vacancy here, right? And you break the bond between the metal and the ceramic. And so as you gradually peel the oxygens out, you basically unglue the platinum and it no longer is stationary on the support. And so it's, it's free to now move. And remember that there's a very strong reaction between the CO and the platinum. And so that combination of breaking the cohesion between the metal and the ceramic plus the very strong coverage of CO on the surface of the platinum leads to this fluxional behavior that we're seeing here. 
Now, let me go on to the next observation that Josh made, which is the creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies. Notice it's in the terrace region um, between the two plant and nanoparticles. It's not just localized to the immediate perimeter site of the metal ceramic uh, so-called three-phase boundary. It actually spreads out. And so once again, Josh came up with ways of quantifying the degree of smearing here. And again, I, I, I may not go into all the details here, but again, you see this linear relationship. The more smeared out the area is, uh, that correlates with higher catalytic activity. So he's now correlating the oxygen creation and annihilation on this terrace with catalytic functionality. And the other thing that he's he found, which is not so obvious from the image here, is this actually an outward relaxation of this monolayer. The outward relaxation, you know, when there's no catalysis going on, the spacing between this layer and this layer is about 3.05 angstrom. And as catalysis takes, uh, takes place, that expands out to about 3.2 angstroms. And we know from, because we know Syria very well, that that's consistent with forming uh, CE plus three uh, cation. So CE in the fully oxidized state is plus four. Uh, as you start to create oxygen vacancies, you end up creating a plus three cation and those plus three cations are bigger than the plus four. And so the lattice relaxes out. So two more indications of structural uh, fluctuations and variations correlated with catalytic functionality. The final thing that we've looked at is the strain. So um, we can measure, and again, I won't go through the details of how we do this, but we can measure the local strain at the surface of the seria and at the interface, and we can do it under the different catalytic conditions. So this is just a cartoon representation of that. And this, the, the red bars you see here is the strain between adjacent atoms normalized to the bulk. So this is the bond strength, the bond length, if you will, normalized to the the bulk bond length. And I know you can't read the numbers here, but basically the strains that you see here, the reds and the blue, so we've got a compressive and tensile strain fields changing rapidly. Um, and the strains are pretty big. They're about 15 to 20 percent. So that's a, that's a very large strain for those of you that know about such things, especially in a ceramic. But it doesn't change with catalytic functionality. So the average strain, which is in this case measured over 12.5 seconds, doesn't change uh, with catalytic functionality. So the structure is strained and we don't see any change. But we can measure something called a fluxional strain, which is the strain that's associated with these atoms moving backwards and forwards. And again, I won't go into the details of how we do that. Basically, the the, 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 remember that the cation motion uh, results in the cations becoming smeared and elongated in a certain direction. And so you can measure the elongation uh, between two neighboring cations, and then you can estimate what the, a sort of instantaneous strain might be at a particular point in time. And it turns out that that fluxional strain does correlate with catalytic functionality. So when there's no um, catalysis going on, the fluxional strain is about 19%, which matches this static strain that we've measured before. As the catalyst becomes more active, the structural strain, the fluxional strain increases and becomes about 35%, which is really a huge, I mean, I think I've never seen 35% strain in anything, 34% strain in anything. It's, remember, it's only the top layer here. So what we can say now is that that connecting terrace is under huge strain. Um, it's going to have very, react. it's going to be incredibly re reactive. And so it almost certainly that's the site where oxygen reduction takes place. The oxygen reduction is probably taking place at this highly strained uh, uh, terrace site here. And then it's ionic transport, it's then been transported to the perimeter sites here where the CO oxidation takes place. So that's uh, taken Josh three years to figure all of this out. It's very hard electron microscopy, very, very challenging. And the analysis is, you know, uh, you're dealing with very noisy data sets. Um, it's hard to do the analysis, but I think uh, that, that there's going to be a paper submitted hopefully in another few weeks on this uh, to probably ACS catalysis. So what have we learned? We've learned that we can see fluxional behavior We've learned that 
it is connected, at least in some cases, to functionality, to catalytic functionality. And so we really want to push this much further. Uh, but we need to come up with um, ways of providing much more rigorous quantitative descriptors of these spatio-temporal dynamics that we're seeing. And of course, when we, if we can do that, then we can also think of applying this to other areas. Um, and the issue is, if you want to really analyze this, how do we, we the, the analysis I've shown you, I've not shown you an, an analysis of the kind of frame on the left here. That's too hard for us. We can't do that. We might be able to do something with the frame in the right, but we can't do anything with the frame in the left. It's changing too quickly. So, but of course, we want to get information about the fluxional behavior for things like the frame on the left. So how do we get a handle on that? Um, we need to run our detectors much faster. So this is 40 frames per second. The new detectors will run at 1,000 frames per second. The signal to noise will be terrible. Um, but we need to generate very, very large data sets to sample all the different metastable states that are present. And because we're dealing with enormous data sets, we need to use, and I'm not showing you all the applications of machine learning that we're doing in this, but uh, we're talking to our data scientists and mathematician friends about how to process terabytes of data that are very noisy and extract this fluxional behavior because we would like to link that to you know, kinetics and structure. So I'm just going to show you a little bit to finish off uh, how we're moving towards that. This is very much mostly work in progress. Ethan Lorne started this. Uh, so now this is a Syria nanoparticle. It's actually the one that was on the first uh, frame. And we're now running the detector at 400 frames per second. So here's one image recorded at 400 frames per second. Here's the movie, right? Very noisy. Um, there is fluxional behavior going on on this nanoparticle. And Ethan took some of this data and tried to analyze the fluxional behavior that was going on. And so here's just three time averaged frames of that nanoparticle. And you can see, for example, he's labeled positions one and two here. In this frame, position one is occupied, position two is unoccupied, um, about uh, 0.15 seconds afterwards, position one is now unoccupied, position two is occupied, and then another tenth of a second afterwards, position one and position two are occupied. And so he was able to try and analyze this data. And what he's showing you now is the occupancy of this column, position one, as a function of time. Okay, And you can see he's got error bars in here. And you can see rapid changes. Notice that this is a column, the, this value here corresponds to five atoms in the column. We can figure out how many atoms are in the column with image simulation. But Ethan, this was fabulous work that Ethan did, but it's half a second of data. <laughs> so, so, and in fact, the data that he acquired was, you know, 30 seconds in total. So, you know, it took him two years to do half a second. We want to acquire tens of thousands or tens of millions of frames. So we need to come up with a better approach to analysis. So um, uh, Josh and Ramon in the group have been thinking a lot about this uh, with some of our data scientists. And so we're looking at going to state models to try and analyze the fluxional behavior. So here's this little nanoparticle and here's just a cartoon of it here just to get the bearings. And if you go through and you look at the structure of that nanoparticle, you can see that there are different structural configurations that are shown here. This is Ramon is just showing 11 of them here. So you see this one here with the nice flat top. Um, this is actually is quite a low energy configuration. And then if you look at uh, state number two, um, it has the flat top, but with one add atom on top there. And typically when you have one atom, add atom, that's a very unstable configuration. Um, and, and it tends to uh, not like to be in that state. But um, Ramon has analyzed 10,000 frames of this movie and all of these structures appear at different times in the frame. And in order to try and come up with a systematic logical way of doing this, um, there's many different ways in which you can define states, but this is a simple uh, way that we're doing it right now. We have this, what we call a binary state descriptor where we label every column in the nanoparticle. So there's 26, 27 columns in this nanoparticle. And if the column is occupied, um, it's 
associated with binary one. If the column is unoccupied, it's associated with zero. So here's a list of all the columns, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And at a particular frame, uh, he looks at a particular point in time and determines whether or not there's an atomic column there or not. So zero, one, one, zero, zero. So each one of these states can be coded as a, a, a binary number. And then you look to see in all 10,000 frames which state exists. <laughs> so, um, and so this is kind of interesting. This is, once you've analyzed all 10,000 frames, you can look at when a particular state exists in that family of 10,000 frames. So what Ramon is plotting here is uh, we're plotting time along the horizontal axis and he's looking at the time that state one is created and annihilated. So if you see a blue line, that means state one exists. When there's no blue line, that means state one is annihilated. It doesn't exist anymore. And so you can see that state one is kind of more or less appearing and disappearing fairly uniformly through throughout the time sequence. It's because it's a low energy state. So it's, it's sort of energetically favorable to form. If you do that for say another state, state six, for example, which has got one atom missing here. So there's more dangling bonds here. And if you look at the, uh, time that state six exists, you can see that hardly exists at all for the first third of the 10,000 frames. And then it starts to exist uh, in the second uh, uh, third of the frame, and then it vanishes again in, uh, uh, towards the last third. And so all the states are not equally represented at equal points in time. There's, there's not just that they're fluctuating, but they're at certain points in time, a state is more favored at certain points in time than, than other points in time. And so then you can rank, you know, how often do you see the states? And he's even measured the lifetime of the states. So for example, the low energy state exists for about four milliseconds. The, the, the less stable states exist for about two milliseconds. So not a huge difference here. You know, this, these are metastable states that are being created and annihilated all the time. It's not thermodynamics here, right? The high energy states come into existence all the time and then they vanish. Uh, you can look at, if. You know, for example, if we're in state one, is state one most likely to transform to state two or to state three or to state four? So we can try and figure out what are the transition probabilities for going between states. And of course, uh, that leads to uh, the best way to represent the transition probabilities in this transition matrix, where each matrix element is telling me the probability of transitioning from the way you read this is you say we're starting in the, the, the this column of states is the starting state and then this the the row is the state it goes to so for example state one going to state seven the probability of that happening is one percent so that's whereas state one going to state two the probability of that happening is 12 percent and once you have these probabilities, you can convert them into activation energies, which I find that my brain works better in terms of activation energy. So we've got activation energies, effective activation energies in the electron volts now. And you can see now that there's, you know, all these matrix elements here, there's a hundred of them. Um, some of the activation energies are very high. We never see these transitions. So he's just, Ramona has just put infinity there. Some of the activation energies are very low. So there's some very favorable, there's what we're, I've just colored in a few of the activation energies, the easy transitions in green, the hard transitions, you know, 0.5 electron volts, a hard transition in red. And now we can go back to the movie, to the structure, and we can see what structures are associated with easy, transitions and which structures are associated with hard transitions. So here again, I'm running out of time. I know I could, I need to stop. Um, here are some examples of easy structural transformations on the left. And here are some examples of structural transformations that are on that are not easy. So for example, if you remember this structure with the flat top is a low energy configuration, it does not like to go to this structure here where you have this add atom on top and another add atom missing there. So that's a that's an unfavorable transformation. Whereas if you look at this one over here, here's my favored structure. The starting state has got one atom missing from the middle. So this structure likes to quickly transform to this structure that's energetically favorable. So this is the way that we're looking at doing this. Um, to do this in a more rigorous way, uh, our mathematician friends are developing so-called hidden Markov models. 
Uh, the advantage of that is that it allows us to establish a much more rigorous link between the observed structures and statistical mechanics. And that should allow us to then connect the fluxional behavior uh, to more detailed descriptions of the kinetics. And then by talking to our friends uh, with the, or DFT friends, we're hoping to be able to also link that, in this case, to catalytic functionality. So I know I've run out of time. Um, so let me just uh, say that, you know, these spatial temporal structural changes we can now follow in the electron microscope with picos, uh, picometer and millisecond precision. Um, I showed you some examples of using cation fluxional instabilities to detect the creation and annihilation of oxygen vacancies. Um, I showed you that the fluxional behavior, at least for some cases, does correlate directly with uh, functionality, in this case, catalytic functionality. But there's a lot of work that needs to be do done. We need to come up with descriptors for fluxionality. How do we describe a fluctuating system? We can't just say it's randomly changing. It's not randomly changing. It's, it's changing in a, a way that's, that, that should be describable quantitatively so that we can link uh, fluxional behavior with structure and kinetics. And finally, I just want to thank, uh, first of all, all the people that did it, uh, Tara Boland for the calculations, Ethan Lawrence, Joshua Vincent hiding at the back there, Ramon, uh, Ben Miller, uh, Piyush helped out with the strain measurements, and Barnaby Levin did a lot of the coding for fitting Gaussings to the, the peaks. Uh, we have lots of collaborators that are involved in this work and funding from the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. And thanks very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, that was a very nice talk. Uh, I definitely learned a lot of things. I may have some questions later on. But uh, just to clarify uh, your question regarding, uh, we are going to be sharing this uh, presentation on YouTube. So even if your collaborators may not have managed to like log in, uh, we can we can I can send out the link and this will okay, be exactly. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Very and much. yeah. So, and we have a fairly good uh, turnout today. You have, I saw it touching 78 or 80, I guess, uh, at some point. So, so that was good. Uh, so yeah, uh, so thanks for joining in. So uh, now let's uh, uh, have questions. So I think uh, Shantanu has a lot of questions, but then uh, Shantanu, so Shantanu can start with his questions, but then if anyone else wants to like join the discussion and maybe ask something in the middle, that's also fine. Yeah, Shantanu, I can, can you unmute and ask a question? And I usually, Shantanu has been in many of my classes, so I usually tell Shantanu he's allowed one question and then he has to let other people go. You probably <laughs> have found the same. Okay, okay Shantanu, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay. <laughs> Hello, sir. So, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, uh, it's okay, like, I have one question and the other one very short question. So the first question uh, is very important as you see that uh, uh, we have like lattice vibrations going on and everything with the 10 to 12 Hertz frequency. Right. So when uh, you see actually the movement or some like how, how much the strain is or anything is, so how can you precisely quantify these uh, distances or the spatial movements? In real okay. time, in in situ. First of all, the thermal fluctuations, which are the phonon vibrations, uh, as, as you say, that's a frequency of about 10 to the 12 hertz, right? So we cannot see that, right? So we cannot see those vibrations. You, If you want to see the distortion of the lattice caused by phonons, you need to go to what are called ultra-fast techniques, and they are being developed, you know, uh, the XVEL, of course, here, but there are ultra-fast electron microscopy techniques that people develop, uh, but we are not using ultra-fast. So we're not seeing the, the fluctuations that we're seeing are not phonon fluctuations. However, the thermal fluctuations, the phonon fluctuations drive chemical change, right? That's what, you know, when you have this activation energy barrier, uh, the, the reason you can overcome that activation energy barrier is because, you know, there are thermal fluctuations of a bunch of phonons come along at the same time to one site and they, they kick the oxygen out of the lattice. So what we're seeing is not, we're seeing the chemical, the change in the structure that's caused by breaking and forming chemical bonds. And 
if, it's, if we're looking at a thermal process, which all the examples I showed you today were thermal processes, those thermal processes are driven by phonons, at least in the, in the lattice. Uh, but we're not seeing the, the, the phonon vibrations. We're seeing the, the effect of the lattice changing because we're changing the chemical bonds, pulling an oxygen out, for example. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. That was a nice answer. Uh, another just question for the curiosity. Uh, uh, like, <laughs> let's just, no, I wanted to know the time like yeah. it takes to process the data sets. That's it. Last question. So for okay. a supercomputer, how much time it will take to process such huge data sets approximately? Like? Well, it depends what we're doing. So I, I, I didn't show some of the machine learning stuff we're doing for denoising. So Ramon and Josh have worked on that. So we typically need to generate training sets. So we would simulate 20,000 images for a training set. And then our collaborators would train a neural network with that. And I think it takes typically a few days to train the networks. Um, and then, uh, and then the time to process the data depends on how much data you want to process. Um, we would like to do on the fly processing at a thousand frames per second, which means, uh, uh, the hardware is not actually capable of doing that right now. Part of the issue with processing these large data sets is, you know, we could connect a supercomputer to the electron microscope. The problem is the the time it takes you to transfer the huge data sets over to the compute, the supercomputer is, is uh, that's where a lot of the, you lose time. That's the latency. My computer, computer friends talk about this latency. So to do the best on the fly processing of these large data sets, we really need to do it. Uh, we need to change our detectors and build the processors right into the detectors, but we're not doing that now. This is a big area that, that not just in electron microscopy, but in all fields now, there's this just huge explosion of data and everyone's having the same problem. How do we process such large amounts of data? So electron microscopy is just one example where uh, we're having to come up with new ways of thinking about this. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, does any, does uh, anyone else have a question? Krishna? Yeah, Ankit. I I'm not even sure if this is a valid question, but um, uh, let me try. Uh, is the effect of the electron beam, um, how do you deconvolute that on the effect yeah. of the flash? So that's an absolutely valid question. I actually took all those slides out. We, so the, in fact, the last example I showed was um, a fluxional example that we deliberately chose the electron beam to drive the fluctuations for, because for reasons that I maybe won't go into, we were, you know, we were trying to do an easy experiment and sometimes it's hard if you're trying to use hot stages, it just adds a level of complication. So we just decided, it turned out that for a lot of these reducible oxides, the electron beam mode will create oxygen vacancies spontaneously. And so if you increase the electron dose, you can essentially see processes, fluxional processes going on that are the same as the fluxional processes you would see at elevated temperature. Um, so the answer to your question is that uh, a good electron microscopist will tell, and this is for the students, you should always assume that the electron beam is impacting your observations. And then what you have to do is find the effects that the fluxional changes that are caused by the electron beam and differentiate that from the fluxional changes that are, that are caused by say thermal or, you know, or, or electric fields. So we've actually done that. I, again, if you're interested, I can, you know, talk to you or send you the slide, but uh, Everything that we've done, apart from the last example, was thermally driven, not electron beam driven. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor, can I ask a question? Sure. It's so, so, Professor, I have to say this is entirely fascinating. I'm very grateful for your talk, and, and it's just wonderful stuff, I think. But let, let, let me um, let me ask. What does it really mean in terms of an industrial application, for example? Um, you know, what is the implication? You know, you're going to get some idea of how the cattle, let's say you want to scrub carbon monoxide with platinum catalyst. Right, right. So how, how will this potentially change an industrial process? Right. right. So the, the answer to that is um, in industry, for example, 
the design materials for a particular function. So, you know, if you're talking about the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry, they, they want to build catalysts to do certain things. And so those catalysts are designed, right, based on known properties of the material. And so in industry, the more they can understand about how the catalyst functions, the more that can then be folded into the process of designing the catalyst. So, so the way that this type of, um, uh, you might call academic uh, fundamental research would, would play in is that industry would, if industry discover that their catalysts are much more active if they undergo fluxional behaviors, then what I would do is I would want to modify the structure of the interface, for example, in order to bind the metal particle less strongly to the interface so that it'll undergo more fluxional activity. Or, you know, I mean, the classic thing in catalytic applications is that nobody wants to use platinum because it's so expensive. So maybe the functionalities that arise from fluxional behavior might allow us to design a new catalyst using say earth abundant elements which would function just as well as platinum because uh, the, the catalytic functionality is now associated with, with fluxional behavior. And the other way, by the way, just to think about fluxional behavior and why it can change functionality, the theorists um, at UCLA are saying that as you change the bond length, say between two platinum uh, metal atoms, the, uh, the ability of that little cluster of platinum to interact with something else like an adsorbate changes. And so the idea here is that you want to have temporary interactions between the material and the adsorbate in order to trigger a change. And then you want, you know, the, you, you, you then want the metal particle to release the reactant. So this is, you know, Sabatier's principle. You want to grab the reactants and do something to them. And then you want to let go you want the product to let go. So, the, so that's another place where functionality could, could play a big role in functionality. But I, on the other, what I would also say is that this is, it's kind of a new field. I think not many, I think we're working on it and some theory groups are working on it and it's starting to spill out into the community, but there's a lot of, a lot more work needs to be done to understand how it can be say exploited by industry for real applications. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, I think we are about you know we have gone past the twelve fifteen yeah. mark. So uh, I think yeah we can wrap call it today here. But then if you have any questions, I'm sure uh, Peter would be uh, yeah. probably can answer it over email. If yeah. you send an email to him. Yeah. Very happy to just email me your questions and I'll respond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So all right. So let's wrap it up and then. Uh, uh, maybe we'll meet next time, next Friday again. So yeah, thank you, Peter, again. And uh, it was really a nice seminar. So I really enjoyed it. And thank I you listened. For, thank yeah. you for listening. Thank you. All Bye. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.